Good evening. So I can walk through this presentation for you. Presentation I was born to give, frankly. And it's long overdue. Of course, I do want to tell you that it's all commentary. You know, I didn't, wasn't there. I didn't videotape um, the murder and I, I didn't overhear any of the participants confessing to anything. So it really just all is about um, observing things, reading things as a non-lawyer and doing my best to try to come up with what's what. And one of the great mysteries of this case and one of the most debated and one of the most heated arguments is, you know, whether Wendy Allison knew about the plot to kill her ex-husband and the hitmen that were hired through Catherine Magbanoa, who was dating her brother at the time of the murder, who she met a few times, whether she knew or whether she was completely isolated from all the planning, all the consideration, the decision-making to even take this huge, drastic, life-ending decision and life-altering, um, which was executing and you know taking away the life of the father of her sons and where she fit into the planning um, or decision-making and even what she's been doing since all of this evidence has been released and her brother's been arrested, what the behavior looks like, what a normal person would do. Those are the kinds of things I'm going to be observing tonight. And, um, you know, a lot of it's going to be me talking here um, and playing some video, a.k.a. providing receipts, frankly. I went and got receipts for all my points. And um, I will be checking the chat if anybody wants to drop anything. I can't cover all the reasons. So I just cover about, I don't know, 20 or so. And just the things that stick out to me, maybe I'm, you know, my bias is that, you know, they hold stronger weight than other things. Um, but there definitely is more and there's deeper that you could go into each of these little avenues. Um, but these are the ones that I picked. These are the ones I want to discuss. These are the ones I want to, the insights I want to share with you. So again, everyone's, you know, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if Wendy was involved. Um, I don't know how much she knew. I don't know if she gave her blessing. I don't know how you know, how I, I have only have my ideas and opinions, which could change at the minute something else, another piece of evidence, testimony presents itself. So everyone deserves their day in court. And I am just going to be providing you my commentary on this big question, this big, big picture question. And without further ado, I will begin. Like that. All right, let's get going. Was Wendy involved? My commentary, fancy fiction. It's a point-by-point -point analysis. Okay. I guess my first point that I want to share with you is, you know, obviously this is a conspiracy. This is a plot. This involves several people. Some of half have been arrested, which were, you know, the hired guns, literally, and the middle person. Um, and then now that link to the middle person has been charged. And the other mother and daughter have been named you know, co-conspirators. I don't know that everyone is kind of fuzzy around that. I know that they only listed them as that in response to some court filing. Some people say, and it doesn't carry much weight, but I'll go into that a little bit later. But, you know, it was in black and white in court filings. And so that gives me the opportunity to read it and interpret that as, you know, why else would they put that in writing? So um, this is what this is what the board looks like. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, you got the the motive in there. You got the two children. You got the the bullet bourbon, the police line, um, the van, Truscott Drive, and then all the way to the Ferrari and the Roy's and the staple cash all the way to the hitman. So let's go to the first point of why I think Wendy Adelson was involved, my opinion. Okay, come on. It's common sense. It's common sense, right? It's a very close family. They're all up in each other's business. Um, they're talking all the time on the phone. Um, just to take a decision, I know that they treated her as like a princess and, you know, everyone admits that like she has, you know, kind of, she's been babying so much that she can't. She does, you know, and says things and does things um, that seem very um, childlike. So I can kind of get that point. But my counterpoint would be, it's just so obvious. I mean, can, it affects her life so greatly and lives of her children not to get her blessing would be so absurd to me. I just, it would be very hard. It would need someone to make the case, um, you know, with some facts that are really, really, really objective. 
because I'm just not convinced that they would take that decision. I mean, this was a this was a Harvard trained law professor in the North Side Benton Hills Tallahassee, 11 a.m. in the middle of the day. I mean, it's just crazy that this happens. And then, you know, it's a big decision to take. It's a lot of risk to take. You know, what if they what if the hitman got caught leaving the scene? You know, and what if they got caught and they you know implicated? What if Sufredo implicated Wendy? I mean, it's a huge decision. Um, it's just, I don't think they would take it without her. And she, you know, she's a valedictorian. She's very smart. Um, you know, so I just, it, it's just, it's common sense. You know, they wouldn't do this without telling her, in my opinion. It's just, it's, there's a possibility, there's a percentage, but I'm just not buying it. It's unbelievable to me at this point, unless I see something else. The common sense outweighs the other stuff. Okay, number two. Wendy had the strongest motive and, the, and was the largest beneficiary of this decision, right? This changed her life completely. She was, you know, getting drunk every night, talking about how much she hated Tallahassee um, and, you know, just really, really stifled by her situation, hated her ex, hated sharing custody, you know, just cha physical demeanor changed around him. He had the whole family, you know, venomous as hell about this guy. And then, you know, all of a sudden, the next day, snap your fingers, the day after the memorial, she's down in Miami. She's living in this, like, beautiful, like, you know, beautiful building, driving luxury, hurt your parents' luxury cars, I hear, you know, dating rich men. Um, you know, all of a sudden, she's got, like, a victim. She's the star. She's got all this attention, which may be, you know, very attractive to certain people, um, to, have, to be that kind of center of attention. I'm not saying that's true, but it's, it's something to think about. And, you know, she's... All, all the financial incentives that came with it, that just not having to, you know, make decisions with somebody that you hate on a daily basis. Everything changed for her. Her job changed. Everything, everything that was bothering her at that point um, and holding her back was a little, was evaporated by this decision. You know, and she even says, I, you know, I understand what the, why you would think this, why you would think I'm a suspect. It's always the ex-wife. Well, yeah, this is why. It's just common sense. It's honest face. We have to talk about point number two. She had the strongest motive and she was the largest beneficiary of the decision of his death, of his murder. It's not even his death, his murder. Okay. She wrote a book, Wendy, foreshadowing all of this. I mean, hello, we got to talk about it. She wrote a book about how she was in Hiawassee Springs. I mean, come on. That's Tallahassee. And it was some sort of Florida. She was mad because she even wrote in there that she was mad in there or upset because she didn't do her research or her character, Lily Goat, which if you think of Mr. or Mrs. Bear, Wendy, Lily, Goat, Mrs. Bear, um, you know, okay, you always have to be a little animal or something. I don't know. But her character was Lily the Goat or whatever. Very, you know, just not pleased with her husband. Um, not that he was mean to her, but she, she, he had become beneath her at that point in her thinking, as far as I've heard from, I've not read the book, but the commentary on it um, and the reviews on it. And, you know, she actually like adopted a baby and said, had a point where she had a confrontation of like, yeah, it's my name, not your name. It'll be, it'll be, you know, my last name, Lily's last name. Like, it was just, we, what, I mean, and then leaving him and taking the kid, changing the name, it's just... You know, and how much she hated the small town that she lived in completely trapped. I mean, it was totally, you know, and she even admitted this is a, you know, in part, this is a book is about me because I want to tell you my experience. She admitted that it was autobiographical in, in many ways. So it's just kind of like, come on, guys. She wrote a book foreshadowing all of this, like changing the kids. Name. It's just, come on. And all the other stuff that parallel her real life. She was unhappy. She didn't like the Tallahassee. Um, she didn't like her husband, um, you know, it's setting the stage for all the things that she denied on the stand. Okay. So th this is um, Jeff talking about what um, it was like, you know, dating Wendy or being with Wendy or Wendy's demeanor and behavior right before um, you know, the murder, or just in her insights about Tallahassee and her drinking. On Wednesday winter, she drank her dinner most nights. Extremely fragile, extremely depressed. Many, many nights um, sitting hated Tallahassee so much that 
Um, on top of a bunch of the country bumpkins on the bike, Tallahassee, just to show Miami, denied that fact, but it was bizarre. And I moved here from Phoenix. Okay. Number four, money, 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 money. I know that, you know, people seem to think, well, that they're wealthy. I don't think they were always wealthy, but the, the uh, Adelsons, I don't think they were always wealthy. I think so there's some, some, something, some point in that family, I, I think they just started getting wealthy. I don't really know, you know, why that is, but um, it's really important if you look here, Here's what we know from the police report um, that I did in my first Patreon, which is, you know, what they did right away is they looked into this life insurance situation. Um, so it says, this is Craig Isom saying, I received a copy of the Markel's life insurance policy through TIA Craft and was supplying the company with a signed subpoena. The policy obtained by Markel in 2012 shows his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, as a primary by beneficiary with a payout of $2 million. On the same date, I received a copy of Markel's Capital Bank checking account spanning one year on supplying the financial institution with a signed subpoena. I received two surveillance videos of Markel making a transaction in the lobby on 7-16-2014. So it was just a few days before he was shot. Um, so that's two million. That's a lot of money. And that would go to Wendy. To Wendy. Not the kids, to Wendy. And if we remember from Ruth's book, she mentioned that how they he had opened that policy while they were in marriage counseling. So she knew about it. And then not to mention the GoFundMe um, that we learned from Ruth's book as well. Um, so let's go here. I think I have it in the next slide. Right here. So in Ruth's book, The Unveiling, um, where she gives her accounts on the murder and um, what it was like for her in the aftermath and all the details. She writes on page 59, the police explained the following money trail, the following the money trail could be a very good way to provide solid leads in solving the case. The police knew that Wendy asked about Dan's life insurance policies just days after his death. This set off alarm bells for investigators. During Dan and Wendy's separation and divorce, there was a lot of disagreement about money. Dan had taken a large life insurance policy around 2012 during the period that he and Wendy were in marriage counseling, and Wendy knew that she was the beneficiary. Following the divorce, Dan changed all the policies, pensions, investments, so that Benjamin and Lincoln were the sole and equal beneficiaries. He did not have a will, but most of his assets had specific designations to the children or went to the estate. By the largest amount was the life insurance policy. Shortly after Dan's murder, Wendy was hungry to know who the beneficiaries were and kept calling the insurance company for exact details. Wow. Right? That's stunning. That's stunning. Just stunning. Now let people talk about that. We learned that from Ruth's book. All right. So one thing that Wendy does on the stand, if anybody's watched part of the trial, she distanced herself as much as she can from anything that might be perceived as um, harmful to her. Um, details. So here's what she says. Look how she's distanced herself for how much the money is and how bad it looks. Ready? Did you or your children benefit financially from your husband's death? Absolutely not. Was there a, did your husband have a life insurance policy? He did have a life insurance policy. And what was the value of that policy? I don't know what the value of it was at the time. I do know that his sister's a custodian of that. Um, life insurance policy and I pay taxes on that money every year, but we don't we don't receive any of it. What was the value of it at the time of your husband's death? It was a million dollars, not two million, a million for each child. Two million dollars. All right. And did you believe prior to your husband's murder that you were the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? No, we were divorced. So I was the custodian while we were married. But once we were divorced I was no longer the custodian. So you were aware that he had designated someone else in that job. You didn't inquire through your attorney about challenging the designation of the sister as the, the custodian of that money? I wasn't trying to challenge the designation, no. Do you have access personally to that money? No. All right. What about a 401k? Did, did your ex-husband have a 401k when he died? I believe he did. All right, and are you the custodian of that money for the benefit of the boys? I am. That's how I pay the taxes. All right, did he have a pension? 
I don't know. Okay. Page 60. And anyone that's commenting, just a note, I'm reading it because I've got two screens up, but anyone that's, I can read your comments and put them on the screen much faster if you actually click on the YouTube link and comment within YouTube. So you got to like click on the, the link itself because um, I, I can read the, the, the things on Patreon, but I can see it much faster on one screen if you actually click in the link. So anyway, Okay, so she's just trying to get away from the fact of how much it is and how bad it looks, you know, and she just lied and said that she didn't, be they didn't benefit in any way. They did benefit. They do benefit. Ridiculous. Okay, so right here, this is, this, this is like extremely troubling to me and something that I learned through his book. Page 60. A GoFundMe was started um, by Dan's friends, friend, uh, Tamara Demko, to get some immediate donations. We were so appreciative to Dan's family and friends for their considerations. The proceeds of the fund were put later in trust for Benjamin Lincoln. We had tried to obtain a GoFundMe donations directly, claiming that they... It says, Wendy tried to obtain GoFundMe donations directly, claiming to be Dan's widow, and added that added, which added further grief and drama to the process. His widow for 50 or 60 grand, I heard. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Calm down. Calm down. No one's going to try to take that money from you. Why are you trying to get, why are you, aren't you scared? Aren't you really scared? Aren't you not eating and terrified? Like you said on the stand in the first trial, not leaving your, how could you, if you're, if you're so consumed that way, how could you be thinking this way? How could you call the insurance company? How could you go behind? I mean, just call tomorrow. Why do you need to say that you're a widow? What's wrong with you? Jeez. As um, survivors, my children receive Social Security benefits, $4,800 a month. That's right. Deferred compensation fund, I don't remember. $217,000, does that sound familiar? I don't remember. Uh, what about the IRA? Do you have an IRA? I really don't know. $100,000? very possible. What about a checking account? I don't know if you, I assume he had a checking account. $15,000 in there, right? Wouldn't go to us, but sure, I imagine if he had a checking account. It wouldn't go to you and the boys? Where did it go? Funeral expenses? All right. All right, and... Okay, right there. So, micro-expressions are kind of, a you know, thrown out a lot out there, but I think we just saw one right there, which is what she determined that she said something that didn't go over well. And I think she, she slipped a little bit, you know, she kind of like, ugh, you know, I said something might be like similar to what she did after the state arrested me, which is what I think people who are reading other people and, you know, I don't know, think of it what you will. But I think we saw a little bit of a slip there. Okay. Number five reason why I think when do you knew about the murder plot? This TV code, the TV situation for the alibi, you know, the geek squad, her mom, you know, saying that, you know, she made the appointment, but they, you know, called her mom. Even how the TV got broken, you know, she says, the, you know, kids threw something at it. It's a broken TV screen. You, you call the guy, he comes right away. Um, and we know, you know, we know the TV is cheaper than hiring a hitman. There's that coincidence as well. It's obviously, it's obviously a code for the murder between the family members. I mean, whether you want to say Wendy knew or not, um, she was definitely retelling that joke um, and, you know, telling Lacoste a week before the murder. So, and she even told the hitman on the day. So it's just all this, there's something, there's something there. It's very shaky. I mean, I, I don't know whether, I mean, I do think her mom set the appointment up for her. Um, she also deleted the appointment from her calendar. It's just a really shaky, weird alibi. If, especially if her mom set it up for her. They called the mom first. It's the TV that her brother, you know, gave for her as a divorce present. And she kept telling this really sick, very relevant joke around it. Um, and then, you know, she went back and forth of whether to replace or repair, she said, saying that the Best Buy guy gave her options of whether to... Um, you know, it would be expensive to repair it. And then she had to call Charlie to help, you know, weigh in on the 
the freaking decision. If you're a grown woman, handle it yourself. I think they were talking for other reasons, but you know, that's just my speculation. But I mean, this TV alibi, I mean, come on, come on. I think, I think if you got to believe that, okay, maybe it's just a, maybe there's a scenario where it's just very convenient. Say there's a scenario where, which, which Donna and Charlie did this behind Wendy's back and she didn't know. So they must have known that she had to get that TV set up and must have set that up so that it's, you know, at the alibi for her, giving her some sort of plausible deniability, I guess, when they were thinking about it. But then how the hell did it get broken? It's pretty convenient that the kids broke it right when the TV needed to be fixed. Again, maybe they could, this all could be explained away as a coincidence, you know, in court. But it just it's just one more thing to add to the freaking pile. It makes the flame even brighter for me. Okay. Weren't very funny about all kinds of things. All right. And was that TV? Did he buy you a TV as a divorce president? He did. And was that TV the same TV that was being repaired at your residence at the time that your husband was murdered? It was. Who made the arrangements for that TV repair? I did. Your mom didn't make those arrangements? I don't believe so. And the repairman was at your house that morning that you had. All right. This kind of ties into that. So, I mean, that's her excuse. That's her alibi. That the weirdness around of who set it up, how the TV got broken, the fact that TV is used to describe that Donna says this TV is about five. You know, the joke of a tip, you know, a hitman or a TV is a divorce present. I mean, it's just, come on. Come on. It's too rich. You're not that clever. You, you're, you thought you were clever. Um, but you look stupid now as I'm analyzing this and sharing it with these 15 people on YouTube here with me right now. Come on. You should know better. You deserve this. You deserve this video against you. Okay. Number six, the deleting of text messages and the calendar appointment the day of the murder. So I obviously did a video about this on my YouTube channel. I'm going to do it again. I think Wendy was shown that as new evidence. I don't know if how they recovered it. I know that they imaged her phone. On the day, um, you know, on the day of the, when they, they took it from her, when the interrogation. So I just don't know what has technology has advanced. I don't know. If, my thinking is that Wendy did not know that they had those text messages or, or those deleted communications pulled off. Or maybe she thought it was a possibility, but it's just very weird behavior. The fact that she deletes all of her calendar appointments. I mean, I would love to see if they could sort of negate that through, you know, if they, obviously if they image her computer, they probably can see if that's her pattern and practice of how she handles calendar appointments. Um, but didn't she know, like, when you delete something, you really can't, like, delete it? Um, I don't know. The whole thing's just really freaking suspect. And I think that she freaked out. You can't see it because she's very good, very good at, like, not showing their emotions. And they're very good under pressure. That's they big sell at that. So any kind of like competitive, if you grow up playing competitive sports, I mean, that's, you kind of learn that. Maybe she did it from like being an academic athlete, you know, doing all, you know, she has that on her Facebook where she's like, you know, like a little trivia, you know, honors roll, you know, whatever academic ball. I don't know what it is, but um, essentially um, I think that she's good like that. And so let's see here, but if you can see that she will not stop staring so I, I think Georgia is literally trying to psych her out, literally through that curve, Bob, like what we've got on you. So you don't know what else we got and really just try to shake her and rattle her. And I think she did. And I think to the casual eye, you won't catch it. But to the train dive, someone points it out, which we'll do on watch together. I think you can see it. So let me play this for you. You may have seen it before, but it's worth it again. And did you delete? Just turn on the far right home there, Peter, better echo 
have to have a TV. Did you delete that appointment to, to have the TV fixed? I'm usually kind of uh, OCD about this, so after I have a meeting, I'll delete it if it's done. I use my calendar kind of like a to do this, so I'll have the meeting and then I'll delete it. Okay. So I won't look to be the once they arrive or sometime later. Okay. And right before the message that indicates you know, this from your mother that we just talked about, that's why I called. Okay. There's a message that says, this is so sweet. Who is that to message to? Okay. 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 You're saying, Your Honor, I don't suspect. That's so sustained. All right. Can you say who the who got that who the message before the Best Buy message? Who would who did you send that message to? It looks like I sent that message to my brother. Your brother Charlie? Yes. All right, and that message was deleted as well. I always believe I don't do But yes, it looks like I deleted She always deletes her messages. Give me a break. And that message, what were you referring to in that message if you know? Look at her. Can't so take her out. They showed up and repaired the TV that morning. They showed up and they tried to repair the TV. But there was, I needed to make a call whether it was worth repairing or whether I should just get it. Look. This was, how old was the TV at this point? She's disturbed. Went through her. Her whole demeanor changes. Right, so it was about a TV that was old. They made a lot of kids have something at the screen, so they cracked it. Okay, but the fix was done in 14 for every 10 to 15 seconds. Okay. All right, so the repair man did show up that one. He puts it away. Yes. And so just interesting. I mean, I just, you know, that was a new, that was new. That was, that. That was something that Georgia, that was an attack, a little speak attack. And um, I think it really threw her and it got her thinking, oh gosh, like what else do I not know? What, what? She she came freaking prepared, no doubt. She, I mean, this is a big freaking deal for her. She came, she wore the same dress twice. She's calculated as hell, okay? So she came freaking prepared. That, that was in a curveball and you can see it in her demeanor. And it's just so slight, ever so slight, just slips a little tiny bit. You can see it. If you want to go back and watch that, video on my channel you, she's I, I see a little bit of like almost fear um but again she's very good at not seeing it okay number seven guys hello classic criminal behavior here it's a classic can't be ignored we gotta gotta lift it up she drove to the crime scene out of her way she lied about it in her first testimony in the first trial saying she didn't turn on Trescott it's a deliberate turn you know down a long, windy street. She went far on it. She said she didn't even turn on it. Um, and even the jurors, you know, the, the one juror, the dissenting juror, who kind of like threw a monkey wrench and that it caused a mistrial, um, in many people's opinions. You know, she even said, like, that was ridiculous. Like, everyone that lived in Tallahassee was just kind of like, well, they all knew, you know, and that she could see the police, you know, that you couldn't see the police state from Centerville. I mean, she just got caught flat But And then she corrected herself. So she could always say she got confused or whatever, but it's just, she drove to the crime scene, period. Period. She drove right up to the crime scene tape, period. Come on. It's a small town. She went way out of her freaking way. Okay. As someone who's lived in Tallahassee, this is, this is something. And anyone lives in Tallahassee knows, look at that. She went all the way up there at that yellow flag, Ocker Ridge Way, where she could have just gone straight across when all and there's a couple right around where she's having lunch, there's some liquor store. She goes out and when she was asked about why she chose that liquor store, she said that was the first one that popped up, right? So like popped in her head. She wasn't using GPS. She was not using anything. Tallahassee is so small, so small. I'm telling you, she lived there for seven years plus. She does not need to look up. If she does. She's a freaking idiot. She should not be driving a car. She should not have a driver's license. She should. I mean, that's scary. They're not, they're not mentally capable of driving if you don't know where the liquor stores. If you've lived in Tallahassee for eight years and she's at her age and goes to all these like parties and dinner parties, she knows where the liquor stores are. She's getting drunk every freaking night, according to Jeffrey Lacoste. 
you know, she knows where to get liquor. So, I mean, that's outstanding. And I guess a lot of people would have to live in Tallahassee to really understand that. But the whole jury got it. You know, it looks bad. Drove to the crime scene, number seven. Hello. I don't know which way I can do for you guys or for the doubters. Okay. Very simple. There's something called the read technique. I looked up on this a little research. Craig Isom goes in and asks her the punishment question, behavioral analysis. It can be, you know, it's not a science, it's an art. And, um, but he goes and, you know, it's explained is that when you're going doing interrogations or really anything, you're trying to get someone to tell the truth or figure out someone's lying to you. Um, and if they're guilty, if it was something, is that what you do is you ask them what should happen to the person that gets caught, you know, what's the punishment should be. And apparently it really throws, it really throws the person um, in the moment because they're under a lot of pressure um, is that they will tend to soften the sentence or if it's, or just, you know, make it much lighter because they don't want to, they don't, they don't, they're thinking about what would happen to them, you know? So they, they pretty much, the th theory is, is how they answer this question. If they're guilty, they'll tell you, right? And the read technique is you kind of like make friends, you play nice guy. It's just like, there's all these different dynamics, but he asked specifically, it's like law, it, it, it can't be denied. He's exactly, it's exactly the move that he's doing. And um, this is, you know, how she answers. So number eight, you know, she says that her family should not be prosecuted if they're wrong. That if you wanted the culpable parties held accountable, unless it was your family. I don't believe I phrased it like that. And I think you're taking my words out of context, but sure. But sure. But sure what? No further questions. All right. We're going to take our break now. Um, Here, I'm this is, right. so, I'm well, let me ask you. If you found out that this was someone that you personally know, would that change your mind about what should happen to that person? About what should happen to that person? For prosecution purposes. Okay, first of all, she did this, and Katie does this a lot, too. And this is just like, you know, if somebody has kids or, you know, even sometimes, you know, even just even being a boss and having people that report to you is like when you apply pressure to somebody, when they answer, they ask you a question, they're buying time. They're buying time. Um, and it's not every time that this happens, but, um, you know, if you can see it in some of my videos, you know, Tara Kwas asked Catherine Magbanoa, you know, people are saying that, you know, that, you know, that Adelson's put aside money for you. Is that true? And she was like, people are saying putting money aside for me, question mark. I mean, they get like all innocent. And even when, you know, he tells her, Craig first asked her, do you know when she's bawling? Do you know who would just do, do something like this? And she threw her hands up, mercy hands, have mercy on me. And that's another behavioral, you know, analysis thing where they create a barrier and they're guilty. They try to create, you know, it's called mercy hands. She does it. She throws her palms up and creates a barrier. And but she says, who would do this? Again, answering with a question. Again, it's an art, not a science. I'm just picking up on things. And maybe, you know, seven out of 10 are real things. Maybe three out of 10 are real things. But I'm still trying to identify things. Um, again, it's all commentary, but, you know, let's just finish this. He asked her the punishment question. Um, no. <laughs> Is there any way that you would think somebody, somebody tried to kill my ex-husband, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Regardless of who it is. I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother, but I don't think it was my family. Uh, anyone outside my immediate family, that's a tough one, okay. but I don't think my immediate family did this. So okay. if it's anybody else, yeah. Okay. I mean, come on. Come on, everyone. And she just kind of like got, but sure. But sure. Let's go watch that again. But sure. She got like a little prissy about that. And she's totally wrong. That's exactly what she said. Look at this. Look at the arrogance on this. That you mm -hmm. wanted the culpable parties held accountable unless it was your family. I don't believe I phrased it like that. And I think you're taking my words out of context, but sure. But sure, watch her sit like she's sitting in a freaking dirty diaper. That's how gross she is. Watch. But sure, but sure what? No further questions. All right, we're going to take our break oh, now. It's just her little head. Oh, where are you? This is crazy. Crazy. <laughs> so she's lying. That's exactly what she said. Don't get all pissed because you're lying. You got caught in a lie. You made a big freaking mistake. Don't commit murder if you can't answer the, you don't even know about the punishment question. 
amateur hour. You were not fit to commit this murder, Wendy. You weren't intelligent enough, I guess. Okay. He's on to her. Okay, number nine. Um, this is a big one. She framed her boyfriend. <laughs> she framed her boyfriend. Boyfriend was calling her out and stuff. They got mad. You all know the story. I'll go into a little bit more here in the video. But, I mean, I'm convinced of this. I believe Jeffrey Lacoste. I mean, if you have to think about it, you're smart. You've tried one time. This is a conspiracy. What you want to do is you want to create smoke and mirrors. You want to send up a lot of false flags so that investigators stay busy investigating things they don't have to really do with you. So if you can create some sort of environment, which is maybe using some reverse psychology um, tactics, whether it's to, you know, set up other people that may, you know, look at, um, you know, that there's like online harassment or, you know, threatening things uh, left on Prof's blog or the rabbis or, you know, this ex-boyfriend or even where she just says like, Danny had a lot of enemies. You know, she said that, I'll go into that a little bit later, but she, you know, yeah, she's kicking up dirt to try to muddy the waters. In my opinion, there's just too much here on, on for me not to think that she didn't frame uh, Jeffrey Lacoste. So let's watch. Let's roll the receipts. Just to set this up. So her friend, um, Jane, who uh, apparently is still a supporter, according to Stephen Epstein and other things I've seen on social media, um, has chosen to stand by her side and is giving her support. But I mean, I put a plant here because I think Jane is a plant. I think I've used this before, this term, useful idiot, um, that, you know, sort of espionage. And that's what the Russians call people that they use. They're useful to them, um, you know, that do things that they don't really know, but they're manipulating in terms of the spy world, um, people that they can use. So. I think that, and we'll talk here, but I believe that she used Jane. And if you watch, she went, she, she was having, pro she created problems with, um, if you, if you listen and believe Jeffrey Lacoste's account, she was creating problems. She was making it weird. Oh, I need a week away, but then I miss you and all this tech stuff in the week away. And then she sees him and then, you know, needs another week break. Um, she, you know, it's, it's just, I think she was actually went to Miami and then came back and then asked for another week at the yoga. So she's just like making things weird and, I don't know. Um, Jeff just seems like a really nice guy that probably just got pushed too far and was, you know, accommodated her. And they started seeing what he saw and confronted her on it. So she didn't like it. So anyway, she goes out a few days before the murder and says all this, this crap about that to, you know, Jane's. So Jane's all freaking prepped up, ready to come in here with this like narrative that's been fed to her. So it, it makes perfect sense. And you can see Wendy baits her. Yes, Jane is the first one to bring up Jeff. But Wendy turns her and says, Jane, who would do this? Watch how she does that. I think it's very calculated. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Sarah, by the way. I'm sorry. Are you a victim advocate? I am. I said you used to be a victim advocate. Oh, that's not true. Yeah, I've done lots of stuff like that. I recognize your name. What's your last name? I've only been here about two and a half years. I am losing my shit. Well, that would be appropriate. I think you should do that. I think if you don't do that, then that's not right. Who would have done this? I, I just have no idea. Is going to come after my kids? Or me? Who's next? Who's going to come after my kids? Is Jeff the special manager? I don't think of Jeff. I hope to God not. Can you ask Jeff? Yeah, of course. I think that that, that it, Wendy's been seeing a guy called Jeff, who's in front of James, um, and he's jealous. Yeah. Are you still currently seeing him, or just something you kind of got to taper off? It's been a bad week. Okay. Yeah, Jane and I have seen for a walk together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> Early this week, earlier this week, you've taken a week, one week break. From I took a one week break from communication with Jeff to figure out what to do. What um, drama? This week, no grown woman for like nine months, so big, ten months a year. Um, and when you use the word dating to you, is that that's my boyfriend, or is it more of just like high school, bro? Yeah, no, like who's my boyfriend okay. and um, involved with the kids? High school. So, I mean, yeah. Um, 
and we had kind of a fight recently, um, and he's been trying to get back together, and I didn't know if I wanted to, and so I, he actually, the morning that I gave that talk, my boys were there, and Jeff was watching them, so I could give the talk, like, he's, um, he's a nice guy. Jane, I think he would, I have to tell them about him. Jane, I have to tell them about him. Oh, you've got to tell them about him. The only thing that I have related to you, related to Danny. The only thing I could come up with was like, his girlfriend, Amy, is recently divorced. Whatever. Okay, so let's hear about June 4th. This is about the setup, right? So we know originally that Sigfredo and Lewis came up per Secreto's proffer and per phone records that they came up on June 4th and were planning to do the murder that evening, according to, I think that's my dog, um, according to um, Lewis Rivera's proffer, right? He said that, and then somehow it was aborted and they, you know, they went back. So they, you know, had gone up twice. So June 4th, really interesting. Hear what Jeff Lacoste has to say about that. Think about this. Think about the coincidence. Again, maybe just another coincidence, but. Stacking up. Uh, June 4th, 2014, do you recall an event that occurred that day that was unusual? Yeah, I remember a couple of unusual occurrences on June 4th. Could you uh, tell us about that? Please? Yeah, I had met uh, Ms. Okay. Adelson at the Red Eye Coffee Shop in Midtown for coffee about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we're going to talk about our relationship a little bit. And she canceled a trip we had planned to California to visit my parents, which was scheduled for July 11th to 17th. Sorry. And was she acting strangely that night? Yeah, that night, um, she was a nervous wreck um, to the point, um, I couldn't put my finger on why at the time, um, to the point where I, uh, she looked kind of way up center goal or there was no convenience store or anything close. And I actually uh, took about 35 minutes and drove to a convenience store to get her uh, Pepto-Bismol because she was such a nervous wreck and had a real nervous stomach that evening. And did she ever tell you what the problem was? No, she's very non specific about it. Were you aware during the course of your relationship with Miss Adelson about Okay, so she sent him out to go get something. Which puts him out in his car. I mean, we can debate forever about which direction he went in or whatever, but he's out in his car at the time, kinda of when the murder's supposed to happen, on a directive of something that Wendy needs. Okay? Again. He probably wouldn't have any gun residue and she probably could live with herself knowing she's doing this to somebody that cares for her and has, she's watched care for her children. But it is something that is useful to her to use him because it's even if they pull him over and try to find him, what that does is that ties up the cop's time. You know, there's only so many detectives on call at a certain time in a small town like Tallahassee. So, you know, she's really smart if that is what she is doing to send something out there to go chase, right? It's just to distract. I think that was quite possibly what this June 4th little, my stomach hurts, go get me medicine was. Did she ever tell you what the problem was? No, she's very not specific about it. You got to think he must have known by only after some time realizing the date and its significance. Okay, this is a big one. Number 10, Louis Rivera implicates Wendy by her own name. He says her name. He says Wendy. The hitman says Wendy, the lady, um, in his proffer. And then furthermore, Secreto calls, says, according to Lewis, says, that's, that's the lady. That's, that's my homie. That's Wendy. Okay. I mean, whether they saw her or whether they didn't, you've got the hitman saying to the driver and the other hit, convicted hitman that the lady is Wendy. That's my homie. So Lewis said he thought that he knew her before. So I don't know. We can go around circles about, you know, where she was, where her phone was, but that implicates her. That means that's directly naming her. Okay, let's roll the receipts. Who's this lady? And he said, that's my homie. I remember her clear as day with him. I'm going to my room and I'm going to see a little this lady. Why she looking so much? She's like, oh, that's that lady. That's Wendy. I said, oh, Lord, I said, man. I said, well, so, you know, I'm like, okay, I see the two kids. I said, what's she doing up here? What's she doing up here? Oh, no, she can't. Let's make sure that everything's all right because he's leaving, he's, leaving out, he's leaving out of town tomorrow. So it's got to get done tomorrow morning before he leaves. Uh, 
All right. That's pretty incriminating, right? For those who think, think Wendy's involved. Okay, well, you got the hitmen saying her name to each other. So, okay, whatever. Seems pretty clear to me. Oh, here's this, number 11. Uh, why I think Wendy was involved. She was hanging out on the beach with the middle woman laughing, you know, right before it. It's Father's Day weekend in June, right? Interesting. And to have a picture of them together at that time, it, it was also very helpful. And who did your brother know that had connections that could get something like that done? I have no idea. Do you know Catherine Magbanoa? I have met Catherine Magban Magbanoa twice, as I mentioned. She was your brother Charlie's girlfriend at the time of this murder, wasn't she? I believe Jeff so. Asked an there may have been other girlfriends at the time. Uh, wait a second. Okay, now answer the question. Specifically at the time of the murder, Catherine Magbanoa was your, your brother's girlfriend at that time, correct? I think so. Okay. And can you identify her? You mentioned you've been to the beach with her on one occasion and dinner on another occasion. Do you see her in the courtroom? I, I do. Could you please point her out and describe what she's wearing? Um, she is sitting over here. She has on a striped blouse and a blazer. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Okay. Did you see that? She felt bad about that. Something very uncomfortable about pointing to her. You think she'd be a little angry. Having looked, you know, she says she hasn't looked at all the evidence, but that's that's someone who's the state and police and law enforcement, FBI, are accusing of murdering the father of her kids, a guy that she was in a relationship for seven years ago and exchanged vows, and you know, just come on. And she looks, she feels bad about it. She's looking over more like you stupid for getting caught, unless of like I'm mad that you killed, you took my kid's dad away from Larry. Look at her. Um, she is sitting over here. She has on a striped blouse and a blazer. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Okay. Here's one, another one. Um, Georgia Kappelman sort of brought this out in the first trial. We did not get Shoderick on the second trial, and it was a freaking damn shame because he was the best thing that happened to that first trial. It's the best thing. And everyone knows it, and everybody talks about it. So, Shoderick, wherever you are, bless you, bless your heart. I hope things are going well for you. You did great that first go around. You gave us a lot of pleasure. Um, and you handled every all those lawyers like a freaking pro, okay? So, he also gave us this little tidbit, which is number 12 of why I think Wendy is involved. He met up with the hitman. He rented the car. He got them drugs. He befriended them, you know, and met up with them on both trips as sort of like a local plug-in. So he gives it, he overhears them after Sigfredo, the genius that he is, shot, a, you know, the gas line in the rental car, which is like the Cohen brothers ask detail that is why we live for this case. But, um, you know, when he, he, he was around them at this time and he rented the hotel and they were trying to figure out what to do with this car, they were in a real pickle and they did not know, um, I guess, you know, the time they did it, whether they're going to be able to fix or whatever. So they're trying to talk about solutions um, or scenarios as, um, you know, Katie would like to call them. But um, one of the scenarios that they discuss is like calling some woman to help them. So let's see, let's hear about that. And uh, Tara Quas mentioned this in her post gaggle. It's like something to point to, obviously saying it's something that implicates Wendy. It was like a, a hint, but um, that came out with Shadrick. We didn't really get too much with the second trial because Shadrick, Shadrick wasn't there, unfortunately. You were in the hotel room or the motel room, and that the guys that you were in the room with were on the phone with somebody that they needed help with the car, that they were talking to some girl. You remember that? You yeah, said something about the people. They said she. I don't know what the conversation was about, but it was like she can come get the car or something like that. That's what I heard. Oh, okay. or, and and they they want conversation on the phone, nothing like that. She was like on my way out, and they were like, ah, uh, she can go with da da some shit like that. I just wanted to make sure you knew what topic I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. You don't know who she is. No. And what they were saying was, no. we need her to come here now to help. Oh, she can, her. yeah, come get that out of the car or whatever. All right, which yeah. would indicate somebody that's local, not somebody that's uh, in another state. Uh, hey. hey. You don't know. You can't uh, tie it, shot her down. Don't, don't even try. No, fair agreement? I don't know. All right. That's how it's Next done, Shadrick. Uh, I'm not trying. That's how it's done, my man. 
Okay. So they want a woman to come get it. There's only one woman in Tallahassee. They probably couldn't get it. Considering we know who they've talked about, another woman that's that lady. That's Wendy. That's my homie. So one plus one equals two, or as I like to say, two plus two equals four, not five. Okay. Number 13, she moved to Miami immediately. I mean, after the memorial service, the movers came right away. And um, two things that kind of support that is uh, my whole my biographic okay two things that support that is two you know testimonies that support that is that jeff lacoste said that when he was talking to wendy on that phone when she was down in miami right before she came back and the murder happened that she was cleaning out her childhood room well okay well what did she go do after the murder happened she went right to her parents house and lived with her parents for a year right just convenient the other thing i'm not it just again added to the stack then Ruth said when she went over to Wendy's house right after the memorial, and she said it looked packed up, you know, kind of ready to go. So, I mean, and she, like, never returned. I mean, she came back and visited, but, I mean, she was out of there as fast as she could fly. And that was, the you know, the motive. That was what Donna said was the number one thing that they wanted non-negotiable out of that divorce, out of that settlement. Number 13. Okay, her behavior. This is a big one. This could probably be go off into a whole nother multi chapters that would stem off from this. Um, but really, if you kind of look at her behavior after the murder and her response to it, okay. So I think that she did a lot of reverse psychology, and I think that she um, really, you know, enjoyed playing the victim role and getting all of that sympathy and attention. Um, so I want to talk, and she, you know, she went on the podcast. So I, you know, again, let's just, it's just bizarre. It could go in many different directions, but, um, okay. Reverse psychology. Okay. She was telling Jeff Lacoste about Charlie having looked into hiring a hitman the week of the murder, just days before the murder, even though that she said that he was looking into it in the previous you know, long before during the custody battle, um, you know, but just the timing of telling him that is like, literally, it's like throwing a little like monkey wrench, you know what I mean? Just kind of, uh, why would you say that? It makes people stop thinking, like reconsider that maybe this isn't as clean, you know, so if just, there's a lot of that. She literally told them about hiring a hitman, you know, didn't make it seem like a present danger, but threw it out in there. And I, I've said too, that I think that that was her little insurance policy that if something happened, if somebody got caught like at the scene and it did come out and it did get traced back to Charlie and did become a he versus she, this would, Jeff Lacoste would come in and say, oh, she she must have been concerned. She must have been like feeling the signs and didn't know um, because she told me, Charlie, you know, so I think that was pretty calculated against her brother as a little insurance, something that would just weigh to her benefit should things really shake out in the wrong direction. Um, reverse psychology again, driving up to Trescott to the crime scene team. Why would you do that if you didn't know? I've seen people write in the comments about thinking of why she did that. Someone said, oh, I, I read someone that said, oh, I don't think she knew. I think she was picking up on things that her family was doing this and reading little signs and that she went and she was investigating on her own, like not knowing. Like just, she had like a feeling. So I've seen people, you know, and it works, you know? Why would she drive up to Trescott that day if she knew? That'd be too obvious, yes? Again, speaking to the, the police department, um, you know, without an attorney and turning over her phone and car, you know, mentioning Charlie and Katie in the the interview um, interrogation where she said, oh, my brother, he's, you know, always busy. He's got a girlfriend, you know, he's just really busy. You know, they're like, I don't know. And then it's the buying of the, the bullet bourbon. Okay. Why pick that brand? Yes. Maybe she says it was like a specific something that she was told to go get, but again, would you go buy a bullet bourbon if you were like a hitman was hitting? Who would do that? That'd be pretty dumb to do that. You know, speaking of, you know, she went in that last lunch. She said, oh, I wasn't in her interrogation. I wasn't speaking too nicely about him. Like she said she was trashing him. She, would a person really do that if they knew that, you know, speak so ill of someone that they knew were getting murdered? No, it doesn't sound that right to me. Oh, whoops. She was also with psychiatrists, you know, so obviously they can attest to how she was acting normally. Um, and she even mentioned to 
I assume that she was like, oh, the last interaction that I had with Dan wasn't great because he wanted to pick them up and go take them swimming because he would be traveling and miss something. I don't know. But um, and she even said she discussed that with Charlie in their phone call that morning is that, you know, and that Charlie convinced her to not get so upset about it and just let Dan take the kids to the swimming pool, which I don't know why she would mention that. Unless it's to show that maybe something in her benefit, something did happen. It did become a Wendy versus Charlie thing. It kind of looked to make Charlie look guilty of saying, like, let it go. Don't worry. It's not going to be a problem. He's not going to be taking them swimming. Just let it go. Don't fight it. And again, telling the hitman joke to both Isom and the TV repair guy, doing that writing class radio podcast where she talked about how her dad had brain cancer. He did not have brain cancer, you know, going to Machu Picchu. She talked about how hard it was for her, her latex husband, you know, um, people have like mentioned, like no one who was guilty would do that. That exonerates her in my eyes. I've read that before from lawyers. Um, one of her best friends is, uh, and advocates is an advocate for fatherhood. Yeah. How bizarre, right? You wouldn't kill, execute your father for custody and because you didn't like him and he was like going to get you disbarred. You wouldn't take away father when your best friend is like the fatherhood, you know, development, developmental expert, benefit, you know, goes and preaches that, how important fathers are. Um, again, she spoke to the Over My Dead Body podcast, um, sort of off the record, but they spoke about it. She did speak to somebody there. She posts, you know, her posting on social media does not look like anyone that, you know, is trying to shy away from this. She posted a Facebook picture in April 2016 that captioned, I love you, Miami, after the bump. She posted a Facebook picture in April 2016 with Charlie and the boys that said, best uncle ever. You know, she's not hiding it. She's not laying low. These are all things that, you know. So right after the probable cause uh, affidavits were released and everybody was like reading about all of their, um, you know, it, for everyone to read everything, you know, had been uh, unsealed. Um, June posts something on her Facebook um, that her Wendy and I think one of their cousins or whatever, um, they're all going out together. So she's showing. So if she's trying to distance herself from her family and Charlie and that probably and her mom, those affidavits that came out. She wouldn't, you know, and that picture was taken down a little bit later off June's uh, uh, account. Um, so that if you go back and were to look now, you would not see that. photo. So someone, I think, asked June to take it down. This is just days after the bump. So she's not like she, it's not like she read the, affid Wendy read the affidavit about her brother and her mom and like didn't talk to them or shied away. This is just days after, you know, so they're all just ignoring it. So that's not someone horrified, but shocked to read that about her brother and the connection with Catherine Magvanoa. That's not someone hiding in fear or distancing them or upset with their brother in any sort of way for what his ex-girlfriend is alleged to have done. So anyway, um, just, you know, the LinkedIn and Instagram trolling, you know, posting about, you know, she posted Justice for Dan. I saw this actually, it's, a lot of this is I'm referring to the work that they've done is they've posted about, you know, reuniting with families at the border while she, you know, keeps away Dan's parents from her own kids. You know, it's just so in its face. Um, and she doesn't post about, you know, too many young men dying, senseless mass shootings and stuff like that. And we all saw Justice for Dan when, you know, sort of the... George Floyd, you know, about, you know, calling the state's attorney to press charges. And this is like, you know, it's just, yeah. Fifteen. She never allowed solo contact with the Markells after the murder. But she left. She didn't let Ruth and Phil talk with them. And then she, you know, whenever they would reunite or whatever, they were always, you know, per Ruth Vic, they were always hovering. She would not were so fearful about, I don't know what, not normal. Wendy also wouldn't be alone with Ruth. Okay, 16, she changed the names and lied about it under oath. Okay, so if you look right here, she dropped the name. She dropped the middle name, Amachai, changed the last name to her last name. And let's see what, you know, I remind you what Ruth's book said about it. The two different accounts that she gave, one on the stand. So Ruth writes on page 73, nevertheless, in the alternative reality that had become my life, I began to realize the surprises were only constants. The heartache never ends. 
In September 2015, Wendy hurt us deeply by emailing me to tell us matter-of-factly that she had changed the boy's last name from Marcadal Adelson for the prior for, um, the prior July for faith, safety's sake, as she said. The timing of her disclosure was no coincidence. We were scheduled to visit her and the boys the next day. The boys had recently started school, and their drawings had already featured their new names, such as the ones that we would see hung on the wall, Lincoln Adelson. This was certainly disingenuous as there was no safety issue for the boys that could relate to their last name. That, but that hurt, but that hurt would not be the last. The perception of the her deceit was compounded when we discovered that she had deleted, she had decided to remove Benjamin's middle name, Amachai, chosen to honor my mother. Changing their last names was also particularly hurtful to Phil, whose only son had kept the family name alive through his American grandsons. So anyway. She emailed her right before the day that, you know, they were supposed to see her. It was after the fact. She said she did it in July. She emailed them the day before a visit in September. Um, and it was very matter of fact, not explaining why. And said she did it out of fear, but there was no reason to remove a middle name out of fear. You know what I mean? It's just a lie. Did you change their legal names about a month or so after the murder? No, about a month or so after it was a Dutch answer in the back. Oh, absolutely not. Um, when I tried to put my children in school and their faces had been unblurred on CNN and all across social media, I'm not I thought you you, but if you'll answer my question, my question is, when were the boys' names changed? The boys' names were changed after I wrote a letter to Danny's family explaining why I was changing their names. When were their names About changed? a year after. And that was when they were legally changed, July 6, 2015. I don't know the date, but it, that sounds correct. Okay. So they were legally changed on that day, but just a month or so after the murder, when you were really been at school, is when they effectively had their names changed. That is not true. And what did you change their names from and to? I changed their last name from their father's last name to mine, from Markel to Adelson. That is correct. And did you also draw the middle name of one of your boys that was a tribute to his paternal side? It was a tribute to both families. So did you drop it? I did. I lost an honor to both families that day. Oh, her, her family. That's so sad. Her family lost an honor, y'all. Wendy, I'm so sorry. And Donna and Harvey and all your ancestors. I'm so sorry that she lost an honor that day as well. And she lied. She lied to make herself sound better. She rewrote history, right? That, that's what, I mean, if you want to believe Ruth, which sounds much more plausible to me. Yeah, it just lies on the stand. It's so easy for her. Look at her. Woe is me, victim. I'll lie to you and to the world. That's not how the name change went down, Wendy. It's not how it went down, princess. Believe Ruth. Hashtag believe Ruth. Skip that trending. Okay. Okay, this is just a little cherry on top for point number 16 of why I think Wendy was involved. It just goes to show there's like no... It, it, the, the deception permeates both big and small. Is that, look, this is her name change document in July. Look, date of the name change or July 8th, 2015. Um, so it was before, you know, it was within a year of the murder. Um, but she, they started having the Adelson name when they went to school in September because we heard from people that the boy ran out of the, Benjamin ran out of the room crying so upset because when he saw his last name had been changed. Probably still dealing with the death of his father um, and processing that. Um, and probably heard Mark Hill and it made him think of his dad, right? So um, if you look here, she... You know, she checked the wrong thing. It says, is the petitioner requesting a former name be restored? She wrote, yes. It's not a former name. So unless there's some sort of admin reason that's explained, this just feels like a lie to me so that she doesn't have to do extra steps or something. Um, anyway. Whatever. Why? It's not restoring a formal name. She's changing it so that she can erase her, you know, the boy's father, in my opinion, and in his family's. And in law enforcement. Who's her friend? Who's her friend? 
Ignorance is bliss down there. South Beach. Okay. Number 17, not cooperating and lying about it or displaying, you know, interest. So Wendy says, you know, through her, her lawyer, issue statements that she's cooperating 100%. Well, she wasn't. She shut it all down. Um, she did what she had to do that day to kind of like, I think, release herself as being a suspect and as the you know prime person they would look at the, the biggest, like I said, point number two, the biggest beneficiary um, of this. Uh, so, you know, but then the minute she didn't have to, she didn't. And maybe that was just her following great legal advice. I'm going to give her that opportunity and, and say that but maybe that's just the choice that she took and that is her right. Um, but at the same time, don't, don't sell us a false bill of goods by saying you're cooperating hundred percent. Cause you know what that does? That makes the Tallahassee community, your friends, your coworkers, everybody thinking that you're like in touch, you're following up, you're trying to figure out who did this. That's not the case. You backed off. You told Jeff Lacoste, you got a different phone number. You were concerned about them looking at you almost immediately. And you skedaddled on out of there and didn't do any follow-up, answer any follow-up questions. And furthermore, you know, you didn't, or anyone in your family never called the police to follow up. What is that about? This You're so scared you're changing names. You're not eating for a month, but you're not calling to follow up. Give me a break. Those scenes don't track. In my opinion. So look right here. So this is something, this is like July 26th. This is like a week or so after the murder. This is like the local newspaper. Tallahassee attorney Jimmy Junkin, so that's the one she's been interrogation in. Jimmy's calling me right now. Should I pick up? Because she can't make an adult decision. Who was representing Markel's ex-wife in their ongoing family law case said last week Allison is distraught, devastated, and scared to death and is cooperating 100% with police. That's not true. She skedaddled, skedaddled out of there. Donna, who said that they would do a follow-up, you know, go in there and talk to him, never did. And she never was to talk to the police or ask about the status of the investigation ever again. Okay? But she has this good girl reputation and all these highfalutin friends, but she, they, they get away with this. She was a person of color. I'm not to get with her, but. After your initial interview with Wendy Adelson, were you ever able to reach her again? I attempted on the Monday following Sunday memorial service. All right. And she basically hung up on you, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And was that your last contact with Wendy Adelson? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. This is the, okay, number 18, her behavior and communications after the arrest. Okay, this is something that's not out there before. This is something in the evidence file. This is a fancy exclusive. This is, you know, this is new. Okay, so what this essentially is, is, you know, I just mentioned how Wendy didn't follow up after the murder. And she, you know, acted like she was terrified, like someone was ch literally chasing her and her kids on the street. Those are the, the moves she made, not eating and, you know, stuff like that, not leaving the house, scared to death. Um, but let's just take a look at this and I'll explain on, on the end as we go through, because they are, I have to walk them through. Okay. So this is an email um, that somebody sent, and it's basically I'll read it. It says, just by means of background, I was friends with Danny through blogging. We wrote for various blogs, but mostly for profs. Danny knew that I was a freelance writer and had a lot of contacts in the book and print media world. He reached out to ask me to help um, Wendy figure out how to get her book out there. As you can see from the messages, I introduced her to blank, big names in the online print media world. Danny was very proud of Wendy and her book. He wanted to help her with it. He was very much in love with her and, and with her, their family. He called her Mrs. Bear. One detail with the police announcement in the spring of 2016, I was a staunch Wendy defender in terms of the murder, not the divorce. While I was furious with how she treated Dan and definitely team, it was definitely team Danny, I thought it was very unfair that she was being named as a suspect by all these reporters and bloggers and online commenters. When at the time, there was no evidence that she was involved. 
I was mostly concerned about Ben and Link, and they would someday Google and read about what had happened and see the people speculating without basis that their mother had murdered their father. Danny loved his son so much and would have been devastated to have them go through any of this. Therefore, I commented on several blogs and the Justice for Dan Facebook page that people should stop speculating that Wendy was involved. Lots of people, including later me, go through terrible divorces and no one kills anyone. Obviously, I changed my tune when the evidence started to come out. But by then, there was actual evidence. Okay, so this is what we know. He's reached out to his network saying about how he loved the book and loved Wendy. You know, the story that got spun for years um, was that she didn't, he didn't read the book and was like very cold and said he didn't like fiction. It was almost like he gave her the cold shoulder about the whole thing and didn't help her, didn't read it, didn't do anything. Here's something to the contrary. Okay. That's not true. Okay. Here's something is another thing. I'm a law professor in Philadelphia and was a friend of Danny's. I also knew Wendy through Danny and have remained Facebook friends with her because I've wanted to see what she is posting. I have some Facebook messages from Danny in the year before his death that I've been holding on to, and I'm not sure what to do with them. They're not evidence in the murder, but they serve to impeach Wendy's credibility. In that, Danny raved to me about Wendy's novel and asked me to help her marketing it. As you know, Wendy has claimed on tape that Danny never read her novel. I also have Facebook communications with Wendy the morning the first announcement that the police had identified Garcia and Rivera. Again, they aren't incriminating, but they're almost too wide-eyed and innocent. If you'd like to see these, you can reply to this email or just call me at blank. I know they aren't much, but every little bit helps. Danny loved his son, son so much, and they brought him so much joy. All of us that knew him want justice to be done here so that their father's memory may be honored. Wow, right? So if you believe Wendy's account, you would believe that her father had brain tumor with cancer, which he didn't. It was a benign thing that was handled, you know, almost 20 years ago successfully. And that you would believe that Danny didn't read her book. We're hearing some things to the contrary. So again, it's just why you have to do your homework and talk to people because um, the fact that he didn't read your book was really used as a wedge to, to say that he was an asshole. Well, maybe that wasn't exactly the case. Maybe that was just a good story that Wendy told to make him look villain-esque. Okay. Here's something, here's the communication that I alluded to in sort of the thumbnail of promoting this live stream. It's number 18. Um, this is a communication that was sent in somebody. It's the morning. So, so, so Ferro Garcia was picked up on the 25th, which is always kind of confusing because they don't announce it to the 26th. And I don't have a lot of clarification on all the timing of when this went down. I would probably have to dig up and sort of go through media accounts and see when it was posted and really do my, my research. So that's not what I'm trying to do. The point I'm trying to make is that this person had an interaction with Wendy at like 11 o'clock. Um, and I just want to read it for you. But it's like, ah, you know, um, it says this person writes to Wendy at 11.09 a.m. Hey, huge day for you. The day that they announced it. So it's a great. I was arrested on the 20, May 26, 2016. Hey, huge day for you. Are you doing okay, Wendy? Thank you. I can't stop shaking. Who is this man? I don't know. Insane. Did they call you last night? Wendy, we have to, we came to Miami to get away from Tallahassee. He lives here in Miami, Dade. No one calls me. I found out on Facebook. Okay. Well, one thing is I thought Ruth told a different story. I thought Ruth was the one that called her and alerted her in the morning, gave her a heads up. Right. Um, I don't know if she was the first to inform her, if Wendy would be honest if she was the first to inform her. But, um, it's just a different account, right? Much like the names, you know, Wendy said that she sent an email before she changed the names explaining why she, she didn't. She sent an email the day before they were going to see them a month after she changed the names and didn't say why, which is a matter of fact. So here somebody's, you know, she's saying no one ever talked to me. And this person says, you got to be kidding. You're the mother of their children. And she, Wendy writes, let's hope we have answers at 1130. Again, this is 1109. They're talking. Is it going to be streamed somewhere? Wendy puts the stream. The person puts, I'll be watching. So one thing, we know that Wendy had dinner in March um, 2014 with Jeff Lacoste and Catherine Magbanawa. And we know that they talked about, you know, that Jeff Lacoste said that Matt, Catherine Magbanawa shared details about um, her husband 
her common law husband and explains, you know, why he was dangerous. And Jeff didn't remember the details, but said it was like some serious, like a gangster. And then Wendy said on the stand when she was asked this most recent trial that um, Charlie had told her that Katie had had an ex and he was kind of scary and hoped he'd stay away from him. So she knows about him. And if she knows Katie, let's just say she was kept out of it and the plot was done behind her back, then a simple, she's a lawyer, a simple email search. I mean, there was photos of Katie and Sigfredo on Facebook. That's what, that was her brother's girlfriend. A simple little check about this. Um, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I don't know when she found out. She's acting as if she's like a child. So we got away and he lives here. You know, no one calls me. I'm, I don't know. It's, it's sus. It's suspect to me. And it was suspect to this person as well. And this is what Ruth writes. On May 25th, 2016, I received a phone call from Craig Isom at midnight to say that he had begun gathering serious evidence and several important developments had occurred. He had picked up Sigfredo Garcia, the first person publicly named by law enforcement as involved in Dan's murder. I called Wendy in the morning to give her a heads up that there would be a police press conference later that day, possibly about an arrest. She proceeded to call me back several times, almost frantically, to get as many details as possible. I was in constant contact with Craig and was advised by him not to have any more communications with Wendy that day. That would be one of the last times that I ever had an extended conversation with her. Okay, so first of all, so Zigfredo was Garcia was arrested, right? So we know that Catherine and Charlie are talking because of the wiretaps, yes? And we know that both Harvey and Donna know about Katie because Harvey was talking about it. It was very clear about the bump situation that he knew and he knew he said Katie's name at the Missouri tape and sushi restaurant. And then we also know Donna was talking about the bump about talking about relationship advice and Katie and so Donna was clued in. So they knew about Katie, they knew about this bump, but Wendy here is acting as if like childlike, you know? Um, and so she's, Bruce thinks that she's told her, right? And when do you think she found out on Facebook? It's just the behavior, the behavior, okay? We're coming up hopefully soon here. Okay, here's another one. Wendy stayed close. Let me go back. When he stayed close after the arrest, I posted that Facebook photo um, shortly after the affidavit was released. And you know, she's going out a week later. She was not horrified. She didn't distance herself. She didn't run to the cops trying to piece together. Oh, Catherine Magdano, I know her. I know that. This is like, uh, she was on the, you know, payroll of our practice. You know, she wasn't doing anything to be helpful. And she was not distancing herself from her mom and her brother after those affidavits were unsealed and dropped. Not at all. She went lockstep with them. So you would even think because of this photo right here, because it was within like a week or two of the affidavit being released, um, you would think that she would be horrified for her sons that her family did this, right? You think you'd see a little bit of distance. You know, I, I wouldn't say, you know, she even, you know, she said that if her parents, if her family did this, that they shouldn't be prosecuted and it should be different. So maybe she was just able to get it over the fact of putting all the pieces together um, really, really quickly because she believes that they shouldn't be prosecuted or nothing should happen to them. So she was able just to let it go. But I mean, if she really didn't know about the murder plot, she wasn't involved in playing, she would, should be horrified, right? She shouldn't be doing this, this picture. The behavior does not track of somebody who, you can't read those affidavits and not have some serious freaking questions for your family, right? What she did after was really telling. She made a choice. Okay, number 20, Charlie was caught on FBI wiretap saying that he talks to Wendy all day on WhatsApp. So this was around the time of the bump that he said this. So, you know, Wendy, all this encrypted conversations, that's why we don't have Wendy on anything because she used WhatsApp to talk to her brother. Now we know this, he admits this. So, um, you know, let's just hear that again. So this, you know, people are wondering why you know, Wendy was the smartest of the crew. She used end-to-end -end encryption to talk to everybody. I don't know. If she wasn't worried, why didn't she just talk to her brother on the message? I talked to five or six people on WhatsApp nonstop. Just to be one of them. I mean, that's a response on WhatsApp because she texted me. 
No, but I mean, I'm sure you woke up and wrote her back or something. Uh, no. Okay. You know, it's not anything, but I mean, if we just, you, you can't say like she wasn't caught in any of the communications. Yes, that's good for her. Um, that makes her look less guilty, but we know she's using end -to -end encry encryption. Why do you think WhatsApp came up so much at this trial? Right? And she's like, oh, it's, I think it can be recovered. No, she, that's she's distancing. Okay. 21. She claims that she does not read any media or talk to her family about the murder. Baloney. Biggest baloney I've ever freaking heard. If you're buying that, you should not, you should not be granted a driver's license by the state that you live in. Um, maybe you can vote because I don't want to take away anyone's constitutional rights. Um, I don't even know if you could feed yourself. You might need to have some sort of fe force feeding situation because you're not able to reason to maybe put, maybe put the fork to your mouth, spoon to your mouth. Then you've got serious issues. If you think that this woman, a lawyer, the murder of her father does not read or look at anything, it affects her life so greatly. I mean, that's just baloney, baloney, baloney. A thinking person cannot believe that, right? Anything? She doesn't read or watch or look at anything based on the advice of her attorney. And she doesn't talk to her mom or brother about it, especially after those affidavits. Give me a break. Who's buying that? Mm, okay. And have they given any police interviews? They would have but the police never contacted them the police did contact them didn't they and they refused no are they represented by counsel they are represented by counsel and they're they will come testify if we want them to if they are under state subpoena just like i was they would come testify all right and do you know what they would testify to they would testify to whatever they know um, um, do you know what they know i have no idea what they know okay. they've never told you no. You've never asked them? No. Because you've never had any conversations with them about this murder? I've been advised by my counsel not to. All right. So nobody, including your brother Charlie, has admitted or denied to you any involvement in the murder one way or the other? Correct. That's so crazy. Correct? All right. One moment, please. Crazy Town, USA. Move right in. She doesn't talk to anybody? She hasn't ever asked her family all this evidence out there. You've got to be kidding me. A thinking person cannot believe that. Talk about someone who needs, Charlie likes to use this phrase, Velcro shoes. And he talks about whether, you know, joking with other women about what it'd be like to have a baby with June. Let me tell you something. If you believe that crock of horseshit, you need Velcro shoes. You probably have Velcro shoes on, in Charlie's words. You just cannot believe that. That's insane to me. Okay, number 22. We're getting to the end here. Because you know the reason why I think uh, Wendy is guilty, maybe a co-conspirator? Because the Georgia Kappelman said it in open court at Charlie's bond hearing. Let's roll the tape. Prosecutors just don't do that for fun. Sorry. Witness and evidence tampering. There is a substantial risk that Charlie Adelson would attempt to corruptly influence trial testimony or otherwise tamper with trial evidence, facing the prospect of an effective life sentence and a near certain conviction. Mr. Adelson has every incentive to influence witnesses who may testify at his trial. Some of those potential witnesses, such as his mother, Donna Adelson, and his sister, Wendy Adelson, are close family members who may also be implicated in Dan Markell's murder and may themselves be subject to future prosecution. There is a substantial risk that Mr. Adelson... Okay. I mean, it's clear as day, right? Okay, number 23. Okay, this is like... We could deep dive down in this. We could deep down, dive down in that Jeff Lacoste gives like a million different reasons of like behavior we could go through of why it implicates that Wendy probably knew more than she didn't, you know, was kept out of it. Um, but here's like the big thing. And obviously I can't prove this. Um, but her, she was acting 
It was bad acting in this interrogation. I did not believe a word of it. I said it before, you know, you take a baby, show me a video on YouTube of a baby getting a hearing aid for the first time and hearing its mother's voice. I'm on the ground beside myself, total loss of control, or, you know, just any kind of, you know, a vet comes back and its dog greets him enthusiastically. I'm That's very moving to me, like little things. I, I do react and the, I felt nothing for her. It felt so freaking fake. The crying that, you know, she goes, and you can see her like switch emotions so, um, so quickly to, you know, crying and then like giving in for matter of fact information. Um, but just the hyperventilating, this is someone she hated. Uh, so anyway, I'm just going to roll the tape for me. Believe what you want to believe. I know that does work for some people. Some people found this to be genuine and commented on that in the media. Um, here, here's just a very, I, I can't pick every little bit, but here's just a little, little tidbit of why I'm just like this, this, here's some little clips of why this is just fake as hell to me. I'm sorry. Fake. I've been to Broadway many freaking times and I don't expect a Broadway freaking performance here. This is not even, it's not lifetime. It's not even good enough to be lifetime. It's like VH1 reality shows. You know what I mean? It's bad. Let's see. I just did a little. <laughs> Covering her face. Covering her face. <laughs> Breathe, Wendy, breathe. Well, before we get into everything, I have to establish where you were and who you were with and so forth. Okay? And then once we established all that, I can give you more details. You understand why I wanted you to come here before I discuss that? Oh my God. So freaking fake. Oh my gosh, good lord. Good lord, guys. <laughs> This is weird as hell, guys. Um, I do cover both. That's creepy as hell to me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, funny to me. I'm, I'm filthy. Isom's in the room, too. What? That's a really strange. That sounds great. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye.
This is funny as hell. She's working herself. She's like, okay, I got to get worked up. They're going to hear me. I know I'm on camera. Watch her work herself up. Your testimony, right? All right. Yes. Anyway, let's go back here one more second. <laughs> what even is that? Okay, here's my freaking final thought, all right? I could have done a lot of other things. Um, you know, I could even have gone and used more examples of these main points and built this out even further. But, I mean, we're almost we're at an hour and a half. And I want to take some questions. But um, these are just the things that are, like, stick out to me. And, you know, please put in there that, you know, what I'm missing. Because I know I am missing things. And I know a lot of people thought it was weird that Wendy said to Isom that in the car ride back that, you know, I didn't, like, she didn't ask about our kids right away, apparently. I just don't have clarification on a lot of things, and I still am a little confused, because so that's why I didn't mention it. But one of the things that a lot of people mention is the fact that she said to Isom, you know, I, I didn't know if you considered me a suspect when we were in the car. And a lot of people think, oh, that was her telling on herself. And maybe that is true. Maybe that was her, you know, sort of showing her that she knew about, you know, something, Um prior but at the same time she could have just been referring to thinking back to you know it must have been uncomfortable not knowing why you're in the back of a police car and thinking that you had done something wrong it's just you know, there's a lot of innuendo in there same with the um stock the bar party you know i see it very plausible that she brought her kid would bring her kids she said she did i mean i just see that backyard very laid back thing happening where you know your, all your friends have young kids and instead of making all your friends go get freaking babysitters you just have a barbecue in the backyard and that's very well what it could have been and probably was. And even when I looked up, it was the summer. And when she said it was starting, it would still be light outside. Hard to get babysitters. I just don't, this is not a cosmopolitan town. Um, if it was a stock to bar party and it was something in New York City or in LA, yes, I would definitely say that's weird. You know, she probably should have had a babysitter, but not, not in Tallahassee. Okay, here we go. That state subpoena gives you immunity for your testimony, right? Yes. Can you explain to the jury, since you're an attorney, what immunity is? Immunity is freedom from prosecution. So that means that anything you say today can't be used against you if the state decides to arrest you later on. The state isn't going to decide to arrest me. <laughs> um. Okay. I mean, what was that? What was that? That's what we're dealing with here. And all the stuff about winning the lotto. The FBI clearly was watching her with the surveillance. I mean, do I think she was involved? Yeah, I think she was involved. Um, do I know that she was involved? No, I don't know I was involved. And I don't, you know, obviously it can't be proven in court or else they would have arrested her. So this is all just commentary. and Everyone deserves their day in court. Um, but these are the things that really stick out to me in a major way. That I decided to pick and put on some sort of short list and share with you of why I think she was involved in the planning. You know, um, she was a major beneficiary, all the sort of weird behavior after not asking, you know, following up on, her, you know, who did this and with the rest, not separating from her family when it, you know, the really obvious evidence came out, you know, just sort of lying on the stand about changing the names, changing the names, sending Jeff Lacoste out the night of the first attempt. Um, canceling that trip to California, you know, when it was, you know, became clear that it was might most likely going to be a July thing that weekend. Um, you know, the quickness is what she moved to Miami. I'm, I'm like regurgitating all the points I just made, but there's so many of them. But it really goes back to number one. Do you believe a woman so smart, so, um, on top of everything, uh, so close with her own family, so deeply unhappy and under the gun and the pressure of an ex-husband that she absolutely freaking hates, gets murdered in broad daylight. A lot of evidence comes out that implicates her family and a woman that she knew was her brother's girlfriend at the time that had gang connections. And she's still very close. She doesn't watch any media, doesn't read anything. It's common sense, guys. You know, it's number one. Number one thing here. It's common sense. Right. You know, all my points are great and back it up. But um, you really got to think with everything I just laid out. 
you know, I know that, you know, the thing people say, you know, when Donna's called by the, you know, when right after the bump and Charlie and Donna are talking and Charlie says, you know, did it involve Wendy? And um, Donna was like, no, 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 no. I think it's because they knew no matter what, it, her name could never come out. They had to keep her completely clean. They were protective of her because she was the ex-wife, you know. They can't have those boys thinking that their mom, no matter what. They probably went to her and said, Wendy, we know you're uncomfortable with this, but we will take the fall. We will make sure we'll keep you completely out of it. We'll think of everything. I'll make the you know, TV repair so you can't, the press can't be pushed to that alibi. You know, we'll do everything just so or really think it out. Um, you see how much that Donna and Charlie just even go into the details of, you know, transportation for their, you know, and for the Costa Rica vacation and, you know, what massages packaged to get, you know, they get, they, they did this, you know, I guess. You know, we heard Jeffrey, I mean, not um, Stephen Epstein's reasons why, but it's just, I feel like my points are much stronger and much more backed up by, you know, points that do, maybe they're circumstantial, but I mean, when they're coupled all together and just common sense, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. This is what I think it is until something else comes out that, you know, convinces me otherwise. But it's just, yeah. What do people have me to say? Obviously, there's more. Okay, let me read your comments. 